On behalf of the National Press Club's Freedom of the Press Committee, I would like to thank you all for coming out during Sunshine Week for what I hope will be an illuminating and thoughtful discussion on what many press freedom advocates believe is an increasingly serious threat to the ability of journalists everywhere to report frankly on government policy without fear of coming under harassment or imprisonment. My name is Rachel Oswald and I will be our mo your moderator tonight. First, I want to give a plug uh, for Sunshine Week at the Press Club. On Friday, we have a luncheon scheduled for 12.30 where our speaker will be Thomas Drake. He's a whistleblower for the NSA who was prosecuted under the Espionage Act. Tickets are $17 and, and can be purchased at press.org. According to a report issued last year by Human Rights Watch, in the years since the terrorist attacks of 9-11, over 140 foreign governments have passed anti-terror laws that have increasingly been used to threaten the ability of journalists everywhere. <clears throat> Human Rights Watch states that, quote, these post-September 11 laws, when viewed as a whole, represent a broad and dangerous expansion of government powers to investigate, arrest, detain, and prosecute individuals at the expense of due process, judicial oversight, and public transparency." End quote. In 2012, a record number of 231 journalists were in prison, according to an investigation by the Committee to Protect Journalists. Of that number, at least 132 journalists were jailed on anti-state charges such as treason, terrorism, and subversion. Currently, U.S. NATO ally Turkey leads all nations in imprisoning journalists, with, including it leads in China and Iran in the incarceration of journalists with approximately 40 reporters behind bars. Other standouts in this category include Ethiopia, Eritrea, Yemen, and Vietnam. But it is the United States who largely led the way and set the example for using anti-terror laws and national security concerns to stifle the voice of journalism. The Committee to Protect Journalists reports that in the last decade, the U.S. has jailed a minimum of 14 journalists in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Guantanamo Bay. Most were officially never charged but were broadly alleged by U.S. officials to have committed terror-related crimes or security violations. These allegations have not been backed up by the U.S. government, CPJ has concluded. There has also been a disturbing push domestically to crack down on coverage of U.S. counterterrorism policies. President Obama has personally intervened to keep a well-known Yemeni journalist behind bars. Abdulela Haider Shaya in 2009 reported with evidence that a U.S. airstrike killed 14 women and 21 children in Yemen. Shaya was arrested in 2010 on terrorism charges, but after coming under considerable pressure by then-President Saleh, um, but after under, under considerable pressure, <laughs> President Saleh was about to issue a pardon when in February 2011, President Obama spoke with him directly on the phone and requested that Shia remain in prison due to his reported, quote, association with Al-Qaeda. Shia is understood to remain behind bars where he has served more than two years of a five-year sentence. Commenting on the issue in an editorial, The Nation magazine said, quote, while paying lip service to media freedom, this administration has undermined the rights of journalists and the whistleblowers who aid them, whose work has sometimes cast the government in, an, in a negative light." End quote. Our distinguished panel tonight will discuss how anti-terror laws are being used by some governments to suppress reporting they do not like. We will first hear from Frank Genuzzi, who serves as Executive Director of Amnesty, Inter of Dep as Deputy Executive Director of Amnesty International USA, and as the head of their DC office. He previously served on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee under our current secretary, under our now Secretary of State, John Kerry, where he was a policy director for East Asia and Pacific Affairs. After Frank, we will hear from Mohamed Keita, who is the Committee to Protect Journalists Africa Advocacy Coordinator. Before joining CPJ, Keita volunteered as a researcher for the non-governmental World Federalist Movement Institute of Global Policy, which works to build international democratic institutions. Keita has also done human rights outreach work in West Africa on behalf of the United Nations. Finally, we will hear from Mark Feldstein, a professor of broadcast journalism at the, Uni at the University of Maryland's Philip Merrill College of Journalism. In his two decades spent as an investigative correspondent for ABC, CNN, and other outlets, Feldstein has been roughed up in the United States, detained and censored by authorities in Egypt, and escorted out of Haiti by armed guards. Feldstein's 2010 book is Poisoning the Press, Richard Nixon, Jack Anderson, and the Rise of Washington's Scandal Culture. 
I should note that the Press Club did invite the State Department to send representative to share the Obama administration's views on our panel topic tonight, but they ultimately were unable to provide us with a speaker. Our format tonight will begin with remarks from each of our three panelists. I will ask that each panelist keep the remarks to no more than 15 minutes. I will then follow up with a few opening questions to the panel, and after that, we will turn it over to you, the audience, for what I anticipate will be an engaging, thought-provoking, and challenging debate. Thank you, Rachel. And um, it falls to me really just to give you the scene setter this evening. And because Rachel has done an admirable job of already covering some of the landscape, I will try to be very brief and allow time for the other panelists who are more expert than I am on the matter to, to address it uh, more fully and to share some of their thoughts. Um, but this topic is one that is very near and dear to me. Uh, I began my professional life as a journalist, uh, writing for the Daily Texan in Austin, Texas. Uh, and at the time, it was my first paying job. Um, and it was so exciting for me to, to make three ninety-five an hour uh, and to write about um, issues like the University of Texas land grabs uh, in East Austin uh, to try to expand their campus. And I even experienced, uh, in a very small way, not the arrest or intimidation uh, that Mark uh, has experienced or the uh, indefinite detention, arrest and torture and trial uh, of journalists around the world as part of a crackdown on counterterrorism. But I did witness the power of the state to stifle, uh, intimidate, and otherwise attempt to silence critics. Um, and so it is a subject that uh, I feel a strong personal attachment to. And now that I've joined Amnesty International uh, after 23 years of uh, uh, working on the forces of evil on Capitol Hill and the State Department, um, I, I feel liberated uh, to share with you some of my concerns tonight. Um, so this subject, of freedom of the press, in a time of heightened national security, international security, and, and, and this uh, uh, paroxysm of, of uh, uh, movements around the world by states um, to put limits on journalists in the interest of security. It's not a new tension. It's not a new phenomenon. In times of warfare and conflict, uh, the first uh, victim, other than truth, uh, is the, the ability of people to speak the truth uh, and to publish the truth, especially if it's an unwelcome truth or critical thoughts. Um, and I was on Capitol Hill on 9-11, on um, and I sat literally on a gutter with Senator Biden for about two hours after the attack. Uh, our cell phones wouldn't work, and we were sitting there uh, wondering how the world was about to change. And the thing that I didn't imagine at the time was the extent to which my own government, through the laws it would enact following 9-11, would contribute to a climate of fear and repression around the world that would empower governments in China or Ethiopia or Bahrain or Saudi Arabia or Israel or Yemen or Venezuela or China um, to enact laws in the interest of national security, which would enable them to do the kinds of things that they would love to have been able to do anyway for other reasons, to just to stifle critics. I don't think it was the intention of the United States uh, uh, in the passing of their post-9-11 laws to give such uh, latitude to governments that were not constrained by a First Amendment, uh, but it has been one of the unfortunate uh, side effects. Now, I love a, a book I can recommend to all of you, uh, Anthony Lewis's uh, biography of the First Amendment, uh, Freedom for the Thought We Hate. Um, uh, the book chronicles the evolution of the protections that are enjoyed uh, or were enjoyed uh, until very recently by U.S. journalists um, that are somewhat unique around the world, protections that, that are found in the First Amendment but which were in fact uh, grown over the course of time through court cases uh, to enable those rights to, to flourish and find full voice. Um, and I think one of the central points of Anthony Lewis's work is that because those rights that so many Americans take for granted are the product of an evolution uh, of judicial activism and judicial interpretation of the Constitution, they're reversible. Uh, we shouldn't think that the First Amendment as it's understood in 2013 is the First Amendment that we were handed 
uh, 200 years ago uh, when, the, when the Bill of Rights were enacted into law. Uh, and in fact, I think we're witnessing an assault on, on many of those First Amendment rights uh, right now. Now, as, as Rachel pointed out, uh, the Committee uh, to Protect Journalists has noted that the United States itself uh, in the last 10 years has arrested at least 14 journalists uh, in Afghanistan, Iraq, um, and, and put some of them in Guantanamo Bay uh, in, in indefinitely without charge. Um, and, and this uh, prosecution of those loosely affiliated in some way, often in a very tangential way, with terrorist organizations or terrorist movements around the world, um, the use of national security laws to imprison these journalists uh, sets a really chilling example to the rest of the world when in fact the United States should be setting the opposite example, the example of maximum protection for freedom of speech, maximum space for those who want to report uh, about the world around them, maximum protection for their, their freedom of speech. Uh, there's one particular case that Amnesty has campaigned on, the case of uh, Sami al Hajj at, at Guantanamo. He was a cameraman for Al Jazeera, uh, spent five years, I think, uh, uh, several years in prison without charge, eventually released, but only after enormous international pressure brought to bear, uh, not just by Amnesty, but by like minded uh, civil society organizations around the world. Um, Imagine yourself as that journalist, attempting to report on the national security challenges around you, the terrorism around you, uh, and being arrested and wrapped up as a co-conspirator uh, because you're trying to do your job as a journalist. Um, and don't think that it couldn't happen to you, I think is the message uh, of this arrest. Um, now, is the United States uniquely responsible for this crackdown on press freedom, I, I think it would be absurd to suggest that. Um, at the same time, the responsibility that rests on the U.S. shoulders uh, as a global example, uh, as the only nation that does have a First Amendment, uh, to me is somewhat profound. All states may have an equal responsibility to ensure freedom of expression, uh, but the United States has a unique capacity uh, to, by its example, help to propagate those values and to help protect them in countries that are not inclined just by their laws or by their culture or by their political history to protect them. So it's a very real, real and serious problem uh, that we face, this tension uh, between uh, promoting freedom of expression and finding the appropriate bounds for security um, uh, to make the world a safer place. But it shouldn't be, in fact, uh, an either-or question of liberty and security. I mean, the best way for the United States and other countries to ensure their liberty, uh, to, to ensure their security, is in fact through the promotion of human rights and, and maximizing human liberty. And violations of human rights are not going to contribute to our security. Um, let me touch on uh, briefly on a, a couple of examples around the world. And then I know Mohammed is going to also take us uh, on a kaleidoscopic uh, uh, but, but brief journey around the world to point out some of the concrete examples uh, of what we're talking about in terms of the, the ways in which new laws around the world are constraining press freedom. Um, so look at a country uh, like Ecuador. Uh, the Committee to Protect Journalists has investigated the shutting down of 11 different radio stations in Ecuador, and they've found that many of those uh, were ones that, not surprisingly, were criticizing the government, and they were shut down as a response to their criticism. And Ecuador is also working within the OAS system to undermine that organization, that regional organization's commitment to press freedoms, to water down the commitments. Um, look at country Kuwait, uh, a U.S ally, U.S. treaty ally. The Press and Publications Law, which was revised in 2006, prohibits the publication of material that insults God uh, or the prophets or Islam. It also forbids criticism of the emir. Now, um, I was pleased to host uh, Aung San Suu Kyi at the museum last September 21st. And uh, some of my uh, young amnesty uh, uh, members put a question to her about um, the Russian punk rock band Pussy Riot. And they said, now, um, Dasu 
do you agree that this Russian band should not be imprisoned for what they did in Russia? And it was very interesting. Uh, Dasu was not eager to jump to their defense. Um, she said, well, it depends, she said. Did they insult someone? And um, my boss, Suzanne Nossel, had to admit, well, yes, they did. Uh, they were quite insulting. Well, who did they insult, she asked. Well, they insulted President Putin. And then she laughed. She said, oh, that's, that's different. Leaders of the country need to understand that their position comes with criticism. And especially uh, in uh, this time of heightened uh, attention to security and the attempts by states around the world to use these laws to stifle criticism of leadership in the name of promoting security and stability, a law that forbids criticism of the Emir in Kuwait um, uh, is not one uh, that the United States should be uh, silent about. We should be criticizing such laws, but we don't uh, any more than we do in the state of Bahrain um, because we have other strategic interests at stake. All right? And you've all heard that, that trade-off. Um, so um, from where I sit in amnesty, um, that is a very short-term approach to advancing U.S. national security interests in the Middle East, uh, standing with emirs and, and sultans who stifle dissent uh, is a formula for those governments to be destabilized over time rather than a formula for them to remain as um, potentially very valuable and fruitful U.S. friends and partners in the region. I just got back from Vietnam. Um, it was the first time that Amnesty has been to Vietnam in about 24 years. And it was a very fruitful visit. Uh, and I was very glad to be there. But I was also very candid with them when I was there. Um, and we talked about the fact that Vietnam is another country that uses national security laws to arrest bloggers uh, for their criticism of the government or for their zealousness uh, to put out an anti-China line that goes farther than what the government feels comfortable with. Um, so um, you have countries across the political spectrum, from democracies to sultanates to one-party states, all of them uh, following a, a, a U.S. example, which is not the example maybe that the United States uh, ought to be setting. Um, and let me turn uh, finally to, to Africa and Ethiopia because I know as, uh, that uh, Mohammed is going to speak about Africa and hopefully this will provide a seamless segue to his presentation um, to you about the assault on press freedoms around the world. But a particular amnesty prisoner of conscience, uh, Eskander Nega. Now Eskander um, uh, and uh, opposition party leader Andualam Aregi, am I pronouncing it? Aregi. 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 Uh, I speak Chinese, but I'm, I'm not as good with the uh, African names yet. I need to work. Um, you know, they were arrested and detained in, in 2011 uh, because of their criticism of the government. Um, and, you know, we care so much about these cases because it is the journalists who are on the front line of trying to inform their body politics about what's happening both in their own countries and around the world. And when you silence you know, the, the architects of speech, when you silence those who are themselves uh, the, the foundation stones of civil society and an informed public, um, then you're, you're stifling not only them, but you're sort of uh, impoverishing the whole body politic of, of a country. Uh, and again, this is a U.S. ally, right? A U.S. ally in the war on terrorism, a country upon whom the United States is relying uh, for military forces in uh, the Horn of Africa, in Somalia, in Mogadishu. Uh, and because of that reliance, the U.S. government has been reluctant um, to, to call the Ethiopian government to account uh, for these violations of basic human rights. So I guess the message from Amnesty International this evening uh, is, is that these assaults on press freedoms are escalating. Uh, that the United States government bears, if not a special responsibility for the assault, it has a, a almost unique ability to set a different example 
Um, and we would call upon the U.S. government to do that, uh, to, to criticize not just uh, U.S. adversaries when it's convenient to do so for their repression of freedom of speech or freedom of the press, but to also hold U.S. allies to the same standard because there's no one standard for the global press freedoms. There is a universal norm at stake here and it is one that has been hard uh, advanced uh, by the efforts of, of very courageous journalists like Shertao in China now serving a part of a 10-year sentence uh, for daring to share with the Chinese people internal deliberations of his own government, uh, which were considered to be secrets by the state. Um, uh, it's incumbent upon the United States to stand with those human rights defenders uh, and to set a very positive example uh, that their rights should not be infringed. Thank you so much for your attention. I look forward to the discussion tonight. Good evening. I'm very honored to be on such a distinguished panel. Originally, I was just going to focus on Africa, which is my area of deep expertise. And I was going to talk a lot about Ethiopia, but uh, I thought it would be more instructive to actually uh, leave you with uh, faces and names of journalists around the world who have been impacted by this uh, very disturbing trend. Um, so that you also get a sense about the scale and the gravity of this problem. And a lot already has been said that I won't repeat, but uh, I, I'm a visual person, so I will use images and, and just talk about images. So as was said, after 9-11, uh, there was a lot of political pressure coming from Washington, especially the Bush administration. As some of you may recall, the former Attorney General John Ashcroft at some point um, did say that uh, it wasn't uh, patriotic to criticize the actions of the U.S. government in the war on terror because it would only quote a terrorist, end of quote. Uh, we also had uh, Secretary of State, uh, Con uh, the National Security Advisor actually, Condoleezza Rice at the time, who was advising media not to air videos of Osama bin Laden because those videos could contain coded uh, messages. So this pressure out of Washington obviously led the, uh, to a lot of uh, self-censorship, a lot of censorship for U.S. media, but also outwardly to the world. The United States as well began these detentions of journalists, indefinite detention of journalists who were held for months or even years on charges that were never substantiated. They were arrested on uh, and essentially accused on based on circumstance and hearsay. Uh, I think the case of Sami al Hajj was mentioned earlier. He's a cameraman working for Al Jazeera who was covering the war in Afghanistan and was picked up and detained for Six years without charge, he was taken to Guantanamo Bay and released after six long years. There were also others in Iraq uh, and other places where the U.S. military was involved. And to this day, the U.S. military has not provided any explanation, uh, has not been held to account for these, ac these detentions which set the wrong example around the world and undermine the work of uh, human rights organization and others. Any, anybody that was fighting for freedom and justice around the world when talking to governments, the U.S. was setting a very bad standard. The political pressure was also applied at the U.N. where the U.N. Security Council is, issued a couple of resolutions that were encouraging member states to take all necessary measures to enact tough anti-terrorism laws and to prevent the incitement of terrorism. The problem with those resolutions was that they lacked any form of guidance, um, so member states had uh, tremendous leeway in enacting anti-terrorism laws as uh, it fitted their purposes. So this led to what we documented at uh, the Committee to Protect Journalists, 
a spike in the worldwide imprisonment of journalists over the last decade since 9-11. Uh, since 2001, the number of journalists detained uh, around the world has not been <coughs> below 120. And the, the, as you can see, the trend is getting worse and worse. Uh, last year in 2012 was a record year, uh, in large part due to Turkey. And an even more alarming statistic, 57% of those imprisoned were held on anti-state charges, including terrorism. Turkey is the world's biggest offender. It's consistently using uh, terrorism and anti-state charges against journalists. And for Turkey, uh, the government likes to link journalists to anti-state or terrorist groups, opposition groups that are designated as terrorist organizations. A lot of these journalists work for pro-Kurdish media, and they are sometimes held for months or years without charge as investigations are pending. Here we have the case of Oslem Agus. She was arrested in March 2012. She works for a um, pro-Kurdish uh, Turkish uh, news agency. She had reported on a story about a number of minors who had allegedly been sexually abused in a prison in Turkey. A lot of these children were Kurdish. She was picked up with a number of Kurdish politicians. She was detained for nearly a year. And she's been charged with belonging to a anti-state or terrorist organization, uh, which is the, uh, Union of of, uh, the Union of Communities in Kurdistan, uh, which is sort of like, a, it's, it's designated by the Turkish government as a terror group. And she was released recently on, on bail, but according to her lawyer, she could face up to 22 years in prison. Turkey, uh, of course, holds the world's record, but the long hand of the Turkish government has extended abroad as well. We have the case of Raj TV, which is based in Denmark. It's a pro-Kurdish uh, TV station. It's been established since 2004. And the Turkish embassy in Copenhagen, beginning in 2005, attempted to shut down this station uh, using various lawsuits. And finally, in uh, 2012, uh, the case finally, a criminal complaint was filed against Roj TV for essentially on the accusation of promoting views of the PKK. And the Turkish embassy also asked the uh, Danish media regulators to revoke the license of Roche TV. The regulators uh, ruled that even though the coverage of Roche TV was one-sided, that the, uh, th this station did not advocate or oppose the views of the PKK, even though it reported the views of the PKK. It did not advocate um, action or it did not advocate for violence. So the, the regulators refused to revoke the license of the station. But in January 2012, a judge imposed a fine of nearly one million US dollars on Roche TV uh, convicting the station of uh, disseminating uh, PKK messages. Um, now, the judge did not shut down Royce TV, and the defense argued that uh, the judgment was based on 0.003% of Royce content, that, that the prosecutor had basically uh, selected the uh, content on the, that was used for the ruling. And uh, the assumption of the court ruling was that Rush TV would be able to cover impartially and in a balanced way uh, the uh, Kurdish issues. And of course, this is an assumption.
that does not consider the uh, difficulty of reporting for journalists in Turkey. Uh, we have had instances where uh, Tur top Turkish officials have refused to participate in press conferences unless a pro-PKK journalist was uh, taken out of the room. So even uh, access to officials in Turkey is tricky. And in this case, there's a speculation that there might have been a political quid pro quo between Turkey and Denmark because the current Secretary General of NATO is Denmark's former prime minister, and when he was uh, running to become the uh, one of the nominees, a candidate for to be uh, Secretary General of NATO, uh, there there has been speculation that uh, Turkey may have conditioned its support of his candidacy in exchange for the shutdown of the station. Now the. Mr. Rasmussen has denied these allegations, but it, it's an interesting idea. I'll move on to US-backed Ethiopia in the Horn of Africa. Uh, Ethiopia is, uh, as was said earlier, a major US counterterrorism partner in the Horn of Africa. And it's a government that has been deepening its ties with China, especially the Chinese Communist Party. and. Uh, it's the country that leads Africa in censoring the internet and uh, dissidents, prisons are filled with dissidents and journalists just like China and the ruling party has become more assertive in becoming authoritarian and defiant uh, as well. Nevertheless, uh, the, the US is still uh, strongly supporting the regime in Addis Ababa for stability now, Ethiopia, under the longtime leader uh, Mela Zenawi, uh, passed this anti terrorism legislation in 2009 that criminalized reporting on banned opposition groups, uh, including the US based uh, Ginbat Sabat, um, who, 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 which is headed by a professor uh, teaching here in Pennsylvania. And two rebel groups fighting the government. So uh, basically, if you're a reporter in Ethiopia and you want to cover, say, a rebel attack on a government position, even the simple action of quoting a statement from one of these groups as a way to balance your report, uh, you're reporting the government side, you're reporting the rebel side, even s quoting a statement from one of these groups is interpreted as lending support to terrorism and carries a prison sentence of up to 20, uh, 20 years in prison. Now, uh, since 2011, 11 journalists have been sentenced um, t based on very vague and broad terror charges. Uh, what you're looking at is actually uh, screen grabs from the longtime leader Mela Zenawi speech in parliament at which he railed against critics and uh, critical journalists and stated in very explicit terms that critical journalists were terror accomplices. Uh, the government has been talking a lot about this uh, very vague terrorist plot this nebulous plot against the country, and anybody that is a dissident is perceived to be a potential terrorist. So some of these journalists are based in the US uh, or are reporting from abroad into Ethiopia, and they have all been sentenced uh, to very serious uh, prison terms. Uh, two of the most emblematic cases are Eskinder Nega to the left, his case was mentioned earlier, and Riyad Alemu, uh, 31 years old, a columnist, very outspoken columnist. We had a chance to review the court papers in both cases, and the evidence presented by the prosecutors is pathetic and laughable. Uh, in the case of Riyad, just to give you an example, uh, they printed an email from her email account because she belonged to this um, opposition listserv. Uh, and this opposition uh, listserv is connected to one of these banned groups. Uh, 
And the prosecutor attempted to assert that by receiving these emails, she was part of a terror network. And another piece of evidence was a photo that she took of an anti-government graffiti in Ethiopia, in the capital, that she emailed to her editor, who's based in Washington here. And uh, the prosecutor, again, asserted that this is evidence that she is uh, part of a terror network. We also have the cases of two Swedish reporters who attempted to get into eastern um, Ethiopia, a region that is the home of a uh, counterinsurgency and a, uh, a region that the government bans access, international media access to, and they were also sentenced for embedding with uh, insurgents. Bahrain is another example, obviously a US-backed uh, ally in Bahrain. Uh, we have the case of uh, this journalist here, who his name is Ahmed Radi, and he was uh, detained for four months and released on bail. And he claimed that while he was in jail, that the uh, prosecutors forced him to sign at least 40 confessions as they were fabricating a case against him. Uh, quickly, I'll just uh, go through this. Russia responds to the hostage crisis in 2002 enacted very tough anti-terrorism legislation essentially to prevent reporting on Dagestan and, and Chechnya. Uh, India, we've had a few cases as well of journalists picked up and accused of uh, membership of anti-state groups. Uh, Sri Lanka, uh, the same. Uh, this journalist, uh, J.S. Uh, Tisanayagam, was uh, sentenced to life in prison. He had reported on abuses by the Indian Army in Sri Lanka. He was uh, convicted of terrorism. And uh, we have cases in Yemen that were actually mentioned here. And uh, I would like to just leave you with uh, three or four thoughts to consider as we look at this issue. One is the vague languages, the definitions used um, by these countries. Uh, two is the issue of designation of groups as terrorist organization. There is no international standard for the definition of terrorism. So this is open to interpretation. Also the issue of best practices. Um, a lot of countries are running into this issue of what are the best practices. I think we should be highlighting those countries that are doing well in terms of implementing anti-terrorism uh, legislation. And finally, the issue of legal challenge, the ability of a journalist uh, dragged in these cases to challenge the constitutionality or even the basis of this anti-terror legislation. There's a lot of work uh, that some groups are doing, but we definitely need a lot more attention to that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mohammed. That was interesting, disturbing, and Frank and Rachel as well. What's that saying about patriotism as the last refuge of scoundrels? Well, since September 11th, terror has been the last refuge, or at least the excuse du jour, the decade anyway, of um, governments around the country. Governments hate to be criticized, whether it's a military despot in the third world or democratically elected governments in the first world. Um, and so uh, they frequently confuse their own political embarrassment with national security. Uh, and what we're hearing about in many cases is just this being used as an excuse to crack down on dissent. Um, the U.S. has been more, is more subtle than uh, a lot of the countries we just heard about. The crackdown uh, doesn't consist of censorship before the fact, as many countries, nor even after the fact punishment in prosecution or violence against journalists, at least not here on U.S. soil for the most part. Instead, uh, the U.S. government chokes off the source of the information to the journalist in the first place. Um, it first does this by classifying documents and information to prevent them from getting into the hands of journalists, uh, prosecuting not the journalists but their sources, um, and then by manipulation, secondly, propaganda to distract and divert attention from these more disturbing 
problems. Uh, the Bush administration, of course, uh, was in place when 9-11 occurred. There was the groundswell of patriotism. Uh, the media uh, was rallying around the flag, anchormen wearing their, you know, fl patriotic American flags on their lapels, mm -hmm. and the kind of voluntary censorship that Frank uh, and Muhammad talked about, uh, choosing not to uh, play the bin Laden tapes because, you know, he might be blinking in a way that uh, sent a signal. Um, uh, the kind of fawning self-coverage of the invasion of Iraq uh, with the embedding, the embedded reporters cheering on their uh, protectors. The Pentagon secretly paying and training uh, media military consultants, uh, veterans, to appear on network television where they were paid as talking head experts and, and giving the administration line. Uh, outsourcing to the tune of more than one billion dollars public relations firms to manipulate the news and news coverage here in the U.S., um, including fake news videos uh, that the administration produced touting its achievements. Um, and then the leaking of classified information, even while prosecuting whistleblowers for doing that, leaking classified information when it served the administration's ends, um, from information that proved to be false about non-existent weapons of mass destruction in Iraq to leaking the undercover identity of a CIA agent, Valerie Plame, to punish her whistleblower husband. Um, perhaps more disturbing, the administration to the, to the public, because we need this information. I mean, the media matters only in so much as it's an intermediary uh, to the public. Um, it's really the public that's being deprived of this information. And this information belongs to us. We pay their salaries. This government operates in our name. We are the sovereign. And when they hold this information back from us, um, they confuse who's really in charge or who ought to be in charge in a democratic government. So information was blocked to the public about uh, all the people who were rounded up, uh, uh, mostly of Middle Eastern descent, after 9-11 as either suspects or so-called material witnesses, uh, military investigations and trials at Gitmo, rendition, the, in essence the outsourcing of torture to secret prisons around the world, domestic eavesdropping by the National Security Agency on American citizens, um, and while doing all this, they began prosecuting the whistleblowers who leak this information that we know about uh, to the news media. We don't know what we don't know, to paraphrase Donald Rumsfeld. So what other secrets there are, uh, we still await. <coughs> Some of it can be kind of silly. I had uh, a couple of FBI agents come by my house um, under the Bush administration. They wanted to seize some dusty old archives uh, for the book I was writing on Jack Anderson, the columnist, uh, who's had battles with the Nixon administration in the 70s, and said there was classified, uh, they suspected there was classified information and that would violate the uh, Espionage Act. So, you know, really kind of carried away here. And unfortunately, uh, President Obama, who campaigned on transparency, um, under his administration, there have been more prosecutions, criminal prosecutions of whistleblowers and in all other previous administrations combined. The, the Thomas Drake case we heard about, Jeffrey Sterling, Bradley Manning, um, and others, and even trying to build a case against the online publisher in Manning's case, Julian Assange. Whenever you think of WikiLeaks and Assange, you know, they were dusting off the Espionage Act uh, to go after it, which is meant for foreign spies, really not for journalistic outlets. Now, you know, to put it all in a little perspective, um, it's not unique to the present. The U.S. government has cl clamped down on national security leaks ever since George Washington was president. John Adams signed the Sedition Act uh, and actually jailed editors for criticizing the government. Thomas Jefferson himself was one of the leaks, uh, leaking what today we would consider a classified document. Um, and it does get worse, as, as discussed, in wartime. Um, during the Civil War, link for, for obvious reasons, you know, the, the tension between liberty and order, um, uh, people are is going to give way more on the cautious side of order than on liberty in wartime. So Lincoln sees the telegraph lines during the Civil War, censored the war dispatches of reporters. World War One, another Sedition Act under Wilson, led to the jailing and the um, 
closing of anti-war uh, newspapers, especially the German-American press. World War II had an actual censorship board which suppressed information from the extent of the damage at Pearl Harbor to uh, the development of the atom bomb. And then since World War II, since the development of uh, nuclear, the nu nuclear bomb, uh, we have really lived in a national security state where the number of classified secrets has grown exponentially. Um, the Cold War was justified by the threat of communism. Today it's the threat of terrorism. There's always an ism there to excuse more secrecy, more clamping down. Um, what's a bit new and different this time is that this war on terror, as it's called, um, seems to be a war without end. That, could last for generations. Um, it's hard to imagine an obvious termination. Um, some, you know, surrender on a, on a, on a battleship like the Japanese, I don't think so. Um, collapse like the Berlin Wall where you know it's over. Again, um, you know, we have to wonder how long will these temporary uh, wartime restrictions continue. So uh, it's interesting that, uh, and I've learned some things here today about the crackdown the U.S. has done abroad, which has been more draconian on the, the journalists who were arrested or, uh, you know, charged abroad or targeted. Um, so there's, you know, still clearly more safeguards here domestically. But um, I'm not quite so naive as to think that the U.S. in its foreign policy is really going to act as a moral beacon to the rest of the world, much as I might like that to happen. Um, but it does give a bit of the green light to other governments, more authoritarian governments, to go ahead and do this kind of thing. And we saw the same thing during the Cold War, where in the name of fighting communism, the U.S. turned a blind eye to all kinds of human rights abuses. Um, uh, and what I fear is that the same thing is really happening now, only in the name of anti-terrorism. And whether these allies are Yemen or Israel or whomever, um, we do a disservice to the ideals we profess to believe in when we ignore that and when we enable that. Thank you. All right, great. I think those were three um, excellent, excellent presentations. I learned a couple of new things. Um, I guess to start off, um, because the State Department is not here, um, the Obama administration is not here, I'm going to try and play devil's advocate and imagine what they might say um, to kind of explain why they have been so publicly silent on these um, cases of journalists being um, jailed under anti-terror law, anti laws. I'd imagine they say something like, you know, with our allies, we work on so many diverse national security issues. There's not just counterterrorism, there's anti-piracy, there's drug trafficking, there's working to stop the spread of nuclear weapons, and we just have to consider such a complex um, array of issues when we decide what to prioritize when we go and talk with our allies bilaterally and multilaterally. And that sometimes we just might decide that this journalist has been imprisoned in Yemen or Eritrea or Ethiopia might not be more important than our national security relationship with that government and we don't want to offend them and sever that, that cooperation. So, um, um, playing devil's advocate, um, what would your response to that be? I'm going to call John Kerry and get you a job. Because <laughs> uh, you, you put it well, Rachel. Um, and I think they would also deny the premise. You know, they would say, well, hold on. Of course we speak out uh, about these cases. We speak out about them all the time. Um, and occasionally they do. Uh, occasionally they do. Um, but what I've found, um, especially since I've left government and begun to look at our government's actions through a different lens, is that what I find is that the uh, incidence of criticism can be directly correlated to, you know, uh, the uh, poorness of the relationship with the United States. So, so if you have a country like Iran, with whom the United States has very tough relations at the moment, uh, then you can be 
you know, absolutely assured uh, that every instance of journalistic repression is going to be chronicled by uh, Ambassador Rice in the UN or by, by Secretary Clinton or, or Secretary Kerry. Uh, but when you've got a U.S. treaty ally upon whom we're relying, there's a much higher like Turkey, like Turkey or, or Bahrain or Yemen or Ethiopia, there's a much greater likelihood that those are going to be overlooked. You know, the question that comes to my mind is, is, is not whether um, the United States or any other country should be expected to, to, to treat everyone uh, equally. Uh, I think it's an unrealistic expectation. Uh, the question I have is, is, is whether the silence, the profound silence on these cases is serving U.S. national security. Um, and I think it's not. Um, I think that if you look at Bahrain in particular as a wonderful case study, um, I do draw parallels even to the time of the Shah of Iran, you know, and, and you see a U.S. treaty ally in the Gulf that has a very significant opposition with whom they are contending, and, and one of the tools they're using are national security laws to lock up bloggers, peace activists, critics, um, and you're seeing an escalation in the violence, a polarization, an intensification of the divisions within the society and a reduction in the ability of the society to solve its differences peacefully by implementing the Bassioni Report, which was uh, an outside report commissioned uh, at, partly at the urging of the U.S. government uh, to provide recommendations to the Bahrainis about how to achieve national reconciliation. And, and the failure of that government to, to implement the report, the failure of the government to release prisoners of conscience uh, is inflaming passions and arguably leading to a situation where you may have revolutionary fervor, violence, and, and uh, insurrection. Um, so is U.S. silence in that case in deference to the Fifth Fleet serving U.S. strategic interests or enabling a government or encouraging a government to stand pat against uh, domestic critics who ought to be uh, listened to, accommodated, uh, and compromised with. Uh, uh, so I don't, I don't look for fair play from our government. I think, again, it's too much to ask that they would treat everyone equally. And I think that, um, that the officials at the State Department of the White House uh, do weigh uh, the importance of these different interests against each other. Um, but in the case of standing up for criticism abroad, um, they're being short-sighted. I would absolutely second that. Um, I can speak extensively about Ethiopia, but in, in that case, you have a government who, which has systematically criminalized any uh, peaceful means of citizen participation in the country by using this anti-terrorism law and other laws that restrict uh, civil society and basic fundamental rights that um, citizens have to participate in the political life of the country and this leads to reactionary the formation of reactionary movements um, and also strengthens the, the the voices of the more radical voices who are calling for uh, violence and and those those voices would call for violence out of desperation, out of desperation of not being able to, uh, you know, peacefully assemble or even peacefully exercise your your opinion without being branded as a terrorist. So it it's I understand that the you know it, it's really stability in the short term, uh, but it's it's really short sighted because in the long term it's a pressure cooker and it's not in U.S. interest at all. And it diminishes the standing of the United States abroad. Mm -hmm. um, and Which can have impacts on other issues we care about beyond national security, like if we ever want to get another treaty passed, you know? Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and lastly, like in, in the case of, of Africa or Ethiopia, there is the factor of China. And I, and I understand that, you know, the Western powers are feeling the competition of China because Beijing is wooing uh, all the African states right now. And, um, you know, there is this, uh, some governments are very clever where they actually <coughs> will bluff to Western diplomats that, you know, if, even if you withhold aid and, you know, you, you are tough on us, we will just go east and, and go to Beijing. 
So, um, but there is this, I think, misconception in the minds of many diplomats that somehow China, what China offers African states is, is equal to, to or better than what uh, the West offers uh, West uh, African government. Because um, in the case of Ethiopia, again, the US is gives that country, I believe, of $1 billion in assistance, mostly humanitarian assistance. And the EU gives them also amount, the same amount of money. There is no accountability for this money. Nobody really, the Ethiopian government is trusted to utilize this money well and get it uh, to the needy. But um, there is no transparency. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a money that's disbursed. On the other hand, the Chinese will not do that. They will not give um, funds um, to a to a state that's no, especially the record of corruption and opacity. They will do soft loans. They will do construction projects, um, but they will not, you know, give this amount of money. And 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 many of these governments are seeking prestige in the West the kind of prestige that they cannot get from Beijing. So there is this misconception in the minds of many diplomats, and they buy this bluff mm -hmm. um, so that we can't be too hard on them because mm -hmm. they will turn to China. Right. And, and in the case of Ethiopia, they're already turned to China politically, and they're building a one-party state styled after the Chinese Communist Party with U.S. dollars, with U.S. assistance. Mm -hmm. That's a very troubling point. Any thoughts on this, Mark? Yeah, I mean, I can jump in, and I'm sure there are people who ask questions, too. I mean, I would just say that, um, you know, we tend to uh, often too narrowly define national security. I mean, I understand there are certain global realities, and sometimes we have to hold our noses with some of the governments we have to do business with. Um, so I'm not naive about that. But um, y we can define national security so narrowly and so rigidly that we fail to realize that, uh, as we did you know, during the Cold War, that communism was not a monolith. Many of the things we perceived as communist movements were actually national liberation movements. Um, and that a lot of what we uh, designate as terrorism isn't necessarily some centralized Al Qaeda you know, link. And that uh, if we were less rigid um, and, and uh, more decent about some of our policies, we would find ourselves on the right side of history instead of the wrong one. Um, you were talking about Iran, and that's you know a perfect example of how we allied ourselves with you know the Shah and his you know regime of torture, and um, you know and there are all these other things that constitute national security too. You mentioned treaties. You know, well, what about global warming? I mean, you know that may end up killing more people in the end than uh, than Al Qaeda and. You know, we need the help of governments everywhere to do that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there are, we box ourselves in when we mm -hmm. define it too narrowly. Right. Um, I have one question, and then we'll turn it over to the audience for, we've got about half an hour of audience Q&A, but one question. Um, right now, uh, we lack an internationally recognized definition of terrorism. There have been talks in the United Nations of um, having a comprehensive convention on international terrorism but um, talks are um, deadlocked right now over how to define terrorism and there's um, debates about whether we distinguish groups who perform what are commonly recognized as terrorist actions you know on on civilians um, versus you know what we would more commonly see as liberation movements and there's a lot of disagreement about that do you think um, a push um, led by the United States to get this convention moving forward, there has been a lot of forward, forward movement on it in some time, do you think uh, that would go um, a ways toward, um, I guess, getting a principle in place that journalists that are targeted could then use in their court cases to defend themselves against charges that they are colluding with terrorists? Well, I, I'm not an attorney. Um, and I don't play one on TV, um, but I think Amnesty International's view on this is that it's actually a little bit of treacherous ground because there is an international rule book already in existence about the use of lethal force, uh, and it is well enshrined in international law and international humanitarian law and human rights law. So there's uh, a corpus of, of uh, legal, 
uh, theory and practice uh, that actually lays out pretty clearly the circumstances under which states can use lethal force. States or other uh, non-state actors can use lethal force. And, and when we talk about terrorism and who is a terrorist, I mean, we're, we're often talking about uh, essentially the use of lethal force, right? Uh, either against combatants or civilians. Um, and so uh, I think my view is that while it might be useful to try to reinforce um, the, the, uh, the rule book that's already in place, for instance, you know, U.S. drone policy, um, U.S. drone policy should be brought squarely into compliance with international norms with respect to the use of lethal force. Uh, there are definitions of what constitutes an imminent threat against which lethal force can be used and, 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 and non-imminent threats against which states are obligated to, to seek non-lethal means. Um, that attempting to define who is a terrorist and, and who's a freedom fighter, uh, to, to, to define you know, um, who is, is fighting for liberty and justice and who is, is fighting for tyranny and oppression. Um, I, I doubt very much that the international community is going to be able to come up with a consensus treaty document that's going to settle that score. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would second that in a way. I mean, there are uh, baseline standards when these resolutions were passed. Um, the UN Security Council did um, encourage states to enact these laws within the framework of the existing uh, human rights conventions, including the International Convention on Civil and Political <laughs> Rights. And there are guidance, guidelines, legal guidelines about you know, the concept of proportionality um, you know, to make sure that these restrictions do not infringe on fundamental rights guaranteed under the Constitution. Uh, the, the, the problem is that you know, in these countries, it's the, the judiciary, the institutions are not independent. They are, they are not functioning. They are very much political tools for certain governments. And it becomes extremely difficult to um, put them to practice when the lead leadership itself is, is not you know, interested. And when you have a country like Ethiopia where 99% of the seats in parliament are controlled by one party. They can pass any law they want. Um, there is no accountability, and the judges are, don't have the independence or, uh, to, to, to rule. And so this is what happens. So I think it's really a call for you know, the, the, the countries that are supposed to be leaders that that these countries cite, you know, like the Ethiopian government constantly defends its anti-terrorism law by stating that it is an exact copy of the British legislation. Mm -hmm. But lawyers do agree that it's, uh, it's the British legislation minus all the um, narrow definitions and civil liberties protections. Um, mm -hmm. But so it's it's really a call on to countries like the UK or the US to really set a good example um, and to really um, support um, journalists or, or individuals who are victims of this because it breeds resentment. Mm. So yeah. I think I said it all. All right, well, let's turn it over to you guys um, in the front first. Uh, okay, yeah, I have two questions. One is, uh, I think it was in 1962, the South African government uh, passed an anti-terrorism law where they, that applied to any South African, black or white. They could, you could be picked up off the street and detained for 120 days without access to your lawyer or to your family. Do you feel that kind of law could end up being applied in this country to uh, American citizens? Also, Mark's point about the FBI, I'm assuming they just showed up to your house without any warning, or did they call you and try and set and <coughs> see if they could meet you somewhere to do it, whereas you would have been able to get an attorney and basically control the time and the place of the interrogation or interview? 
Uh, they did call first, and I was a reporter long enough to know how to handle the FBI, so, I, you know, oh, okay. I didn't feel like I needed my lawyer present. It was just, that was just more of an example of the stupidity and futility. Uh, they were looking at documents for a dead journalist, you know, and, and uh, You didn't have a problem letting them in your home? No, nah, I mean, maybe, you know, maybe I should have been, but okay. I didn't, and I, you know, politely told them to go piss up a robe. <laughs> Politely. I was, that was a paraphrase, not a quote. It's an academic term we use. <laughs> any thoughts on the South that? Africa part? I, I don't have any on that, yeah. no. I don't. Uh, it, you know, it's so tempting to say that such a thing could never happen in the United States. Um, but, right? But. Um, I think the fundamental question that is before the United States is the, the boundaries on government action in response to suspected terrorists. Um, and, you know, it, it's interesting to me that there's been all this debate in Washington the last couple of weeks about drones and the use of drones to, to kill uh, those suspected of being engaged in terrorism. Um, and, you know, the question then becomes, well, all right, it's very, very nice that we're having a debate about uh, execution. What about the much more modest step of detaining for questioning? Um, and, and presumably the same legal authorities that would enable a U.S. president to sign an execution, execution warrant on a U.S. citizen abroad. Um, you know, logically ought to empower the same U.S. president to sign an order to indefinitely detain and question that U.S. citizen abroad. Uh, and it's a paradox that, you know, the live U.S. captive would seemingly have greater habeas corpus rights than the dead American citizen <laughs> at the end of the Hellfire missile. Um, but I, I, think, I think this is an area of U.S. law that does need elaboration, clarification, um, transparency from the Justice Department. Um, because it's not clear to me on the face of it why it would be illegal to indefinitely detain if it is, in fact, legal to kill. That's a very good point. I saw the question I have is deals a little bit with response, self so take this kind of, kind of responsibility for one's actions in the way I'd like to frame the question is, uh, when you touched on Private Manning earlier, uh, if you were to look at a case where Private Manning working from the inside and bound by certain disclosures, oaths, agreements, however you'd like to frame it, as opposed to a journalist, say, in Ethiopia, Eritrea, or Somalia, who's working from outside the system and trying to gain some kind of transparency while working under somewhat to arbitrary, nebulous, I believe the term was used, anti-terror laws. Where is the line of responsibility drawn between these two individuals, between these two um, approaches? You know, is there a responsibility that Private Manning should, you know, accept for some of his actions? So I'm just curious what the panel would have to say about uh, those two, two approaches to the, to the subject. I guess I'd say yes to that, and I um, think he did just plead guilty, whether that was because of uh, embracing his responsibility or the government's case was so ironclad that it's part of trying to cop a better plea. I don't know. When Daniel Ellsberg leaked the Pentagon Papers, um, you know, he was he viewed it as an act of civil disobedience for which he was prepared to go to prison for the rest of his life. And had it not been for the Nixon administration's dirty tricks <clears throat> that obstructed justice, he, that might well have happened. Um, and ironically, of course, that set in motion the chain of events that would topple Nixon. Um, so you're, it's, you're right. It's a fair distinction. Um, and I don't mean to draw equivalency. My point in bringing that up in context was that in the U.S., uh, the authorities, you know, the government is more careful going after the journalists themselves. Instead, they target the sources. Um, whereas abroad, uh, often it's more crude and they go directly after the journalists themselves. But that both, both uh, approaches do lead to choke 
or can lead to choking off information uh, to the public. Uh, well, I'll, I'll just quickly mention the case of the two Swedish uh, reporters who were in prison in Ethiopia. They did um, admit and plead guilty to entering the country illegally. They were embedding with the rebels um, that entered the country from Somalia. And uh, it, the Ethiopian government is perfectly, has the perfect authority and responsibility to prosecute them for entering the country illegally. It's a calculated risk that they took and they were caught. Now, we don't dispute that. Now, the only uh, problem we have is when they attempt to add to that a more serious charge of um, supporting terrorism for embed for embedding and there is no evidence convincing uh, evidence that they presented to back up that charge instead what we saw were um, you know wh what one of the reporters called a mockumentary where they uh, forced these journalists to enact these uh, scenes uh, to reenact their arrest and to as, a, as footage to give the prosecutor to, to make the case, where they're actually trying to make the case or fabricate evidence to make the case. Um, and it was particularly ironic coming from this, this government in, in power in Ethiopia because the, they were themselves once um, freedom fighters and rebels who fought for 18 years in, in, against a despotic regime. And at that time, they were welcoming reporters like the Swedes um, to tell their story to the world and for them to turn around today and, and criminalize that kind of activity, news gathering activity as terrorism is totally uh, pathetic. I, I have nothing to add. I, I, I recently, I mentioned I was in Vietnam, and, and uh, it was so interesting to me to, to see the way that country is, is uh, in some ways opening up, um, and in, in other ways is going through a discussion right now about human rights. And I, I had a chance to visit an art museum in Ho Chi Minh City, in Saigon, and I was struck by the fact that there was artwork there done by battlefield artists. Uh, who traveled with the Viet Minh, right, to to essentially chronicle their struggle against the French and and, and then later against the, the United States. And I was thinking to myself, would these chroniclers, would these artists who painted and depicted the struggle of the Viet Minh and often painted it in heroic terms, um, uh, would they be terrorists under today's standards for aiding and abetting uh, through their artwork, chronicling the struggle, uh, would they be as embedded reporters uh, in that struggle, subject to criminal penalty in today's, you know, environment for for their art? I mean, I, I think we are at a point where we need to think about the difference between those chronicling and reporting and attempting to help the world understand the the conflicts that are broadly part of this global uh, war on terrorism that the United States has declared, uh, and those who are engaged in it as combatants. Uh, and there, there has to be a difference, but that line has become extraordinarily blurry when you start locking up chroniclers or reporters or journalists or artists uh, who, are, who are documenting the world around them. Uh, and using national security laws to to accuse them of being, uh, you know, engaged in that armed struggle. And I would just add one thing um, on the Bradley Manning uh, issue. I think Bradley Manning, like any U.S. citizen who decides to undertake an act of civil disobedience, um, you know, really should be thinking about what price am I willing to pay for this act that I care about. But I think the United States government also needs to be thinking about um, optics. Um, you know, there hasn't yet been really a full public accounting of the WMD intelligence fiasco that got us into the Iraq war. And, uh, you know, we have not yet had really anybody involved in the Wall Street, um, Wall Street uh, shenanigans really um, has had to come to trial yet. So I think optics 
optics are an issue here when we're talking about reputation and what the U.S. government decides to throw the full weight of itself behind that these things all should, you know, it might be a good idea to consider them together. Who else? Um, this is two questions, but they're sort of a lie. <laughs> the first is, given that you, you can't, you can't, or well, we aren't, defi quote, defining terrorism, unquote, for various reasons, which have been spelled out very well, what can and should, what can journalists do to protect themselves? And the second <laughs> is, give, again, let's flip it around, even if you do, quote, define terrorism with a piece of paper of some type or another, how do you get the non-state actors, for lack of a better term, to follow the piece of paper? The, yeah and say, okay, I'm not a terrorist, or okay, I am. Not that they're going to say that, but you get the idea. When you have the answer, let us know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, let's, let's do number Let's do number one first. How, how, what, what measures could, can journalists take, you know, given this, this amorphousness to, to protect themselves? Un unfortunately, a lot of these laws have a chilling effect on um, reporting, and it's a red line because these cases as well for governments when they do this it's also to set an example to intimidate and scare everybody else and when this happens to um, these two Swedish reporters um, now you know international journalists are less likely to want to go investigate the story or take the risk or in, in a country like Ethiopia the coverage of security issues or even um, mild criticism of the, the party is now, the, most journalists have left the country because of that. I was reading your, your report here beforehand, Mexico, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a walking disaster without self-censorship, not because of the laws, but because of the, of the cartels. Right, self-censorship. So, um, to finish your answer to the question, the other, the other two, do you want to jump in? I don't have an answer for you. Yeah, I think the, the, the solution is really to, to build robust, independent institutions, uh, governance, leader, uh, good leadership in these countries, because that's the key, really. If, because in, even in a, in a country like Zimbabwe, where as repressive as Zimbabwe is, um, the institutions are still quite strong and functioning. And at the lower level, with the lower courts, Journalists who get in prison or prosecutors still get acquitted. Um, the, the judge will actually follow the law, and if the police doesn't have evidence, he will dismiss the case. Um, when you go to higher courts and it, it's a political, high-profile case, that's not going to be the case. But the civil service is still strong and functioning. Um, so I think that's really the solution. I, I agree with Mohammed, and, and uh, I'm trying to recall, and maybe someone in the room recalls, but uh, Senator Chris Dodd, a few years ago, was working on legislation, you know, trying to est establish a stronger international protections for journalists. And, and again, it was, it was in response not to just to the arrest of journalists, but to the killing of journalists uh, abroad. I mean, we should remember that this is not just about uh, uh, intimidation and detention. Uh, but you have cases like Anna uh, Politskovskaya uh, in Russia, um, you know, who are executed for their questioning of authority and their criti criticism of authority. And so I think there may be a role for the U.S. government uh, in trying to propagate a norm of greater protection uh, for journalists uh, internationally. Um, and I, I need to revisit whatever happened to that Dodd idea. I think it was a good idea at the time. All right, I don't have an answer for you. Uh, over here. 
So what, what's your what's your question for the My panel? Question regards you know the, the whole thing with journalism and how like the, the press is uh, now free in Taiwan versus in China. You have dissidents like Chen Guangjiang, like he, he still gets you know uh, captured and, and put away and uh, isn't allowed to express his voice freely. I mean, there's a, a double standard there um, in terms of like having to you know subvert yourself to the international law and the governing. Well, you're not going to like the answer, but, um, you know, that's what I meant by there are certain polit geopolitical realities. And when we owe as much money to Taiwan as we do to the People's Republic, um, and when Taiwan's military and nuclear capabilities match those of the PRC, then I suspect <clears throat> uh, the, the Democrat, the, uh, the, the uh, ethical impulse will follow. There's, there's no doubt in my mind that press freedoms are, are stronger in Taiwan than in China. They're imperfect in both places, but they're much stronger in Taiwan where you have a robust debate in the press and independent newspapers and radios and um, journalists are able to, to publish uh, uh, criticisms uh, of the leadership and the ruling party. Um, I don't know what, you know, the other part of your question I, I don't have an opinion on in terms of uh, what that ought to lead the U.S. government to do with respect to how we treat Taiwan and China. I think one is clearly more in the friend category than the other, um, and the relationship with Taiwan is exceptionally close, and the relationship with China is impeded by many things, and, and one of the principal obstacles to a closer relationship is, is China's human rights record. Um, thank you all for being um, I'm, I'm curious, so it was said on the panel that um, the U.S. is willing to pressure countries with which we have poor diplomatic relations, such as in Iran was an example given, but um, still looking at the actual circumstances and the reality of what's, what's going on, um, there <laughs> the Iranian government has not relented in any way towards you know, dissidents or journalists, and the only situations in which they do, um, that I can recall, really involve a lot more kind of like crowdsourced groundswell of grassroots, um, like Amnesty International, you know, non-governmental um, interventions. So I kind of want maybe a little more elaboration on, or maybe a defense of the idea that government, you know, governments talking to each other actually really gets anything done at all. Um, I mean, especially with the lack of the U.S.'s accountability in the first place, like you were talking about. Let, let me take a first cut of this, okay. but, but then I, I look forward to hearing from my colleagues on the panel on it as well. Um, you know, look, for nine years I worked at the State Department and then for 14 years at the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. And for all that time on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, um, I undertook a lot of sort of track to human rights diplomacy. So I would travel to Tibet or I'd go to China or I'd go to southern Thailand where there's an a Islamic a separatist uh, insurgency or Mindanao um, and I would work quietly on human rights issues. And I can tell you that whether at the State Department or on Capitol Hill, um, engagement can make a difference in the practices of, of governments abroad on human rights. Uh, I got people out of prison in China, Tibetan nuns and, and, uh, and others. Um, I got investigations started in Indonesia or in Mindanao that might otherwise have languished, uh, investigations into human rights abuses that, that um, were perpetrated by the armed forces or by the police. And I did it not because of who I was, but because of who I represented, right? You know, if you're there working on behalf of the chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, Joe Biden, or uh, if you're there on behalf of Secretary Jim Baker, uh, guess what? Uh, there was a day when people took that pretty seriously uh, and where U.S. moral authority and U.S. moral suasion um, could make a difference. I had a go-to person in Beijing for many years. I won't name him because he's still in Chinese government. Um, and I could go to him and we would meet one-on-one -on -one very quietly in a tea house that I knew. 
and I would hand him a list. I said, you know, here are the people uh, that my boss is most concerned about right now, and we want three names off that list out of prison, you know, and he would deliver. Um, uh, because the U.S. government, this is all pre-9-11, you know, because the U.S. government had a certain uh, persuasive power. Um, so, so it matters. I mean, it can, it can, it can help. But um, just kind of lobbing your criticisms over the, the fence at the embassy uh, or, or blasting them out in the media, you know, by itself, that's not going to do a whole heck of a lot. Now, I work for Amnesty International. Part of what we do is to shine a spotlight on injustice. But we do it with a certain methodology. You know, we look for cases that are emblematic of systemic problems. And then we try to mobilize coalitions for change. Uh, and we try to work with civil society both in those countries and abroad to bring about the right constellation of forces to help bring about systemic change. And I think there's, there's room in the world for that kind of activism, too. And I think especially in the age of the Internet, uh, in, the, in the age of super-empowered individuals, um, you know, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't sell ourselves short in terms of our ability to affect change. Um, but, you know, I'm still a believer uh, in the ability of governments to persuade other governments to change their behavior uh, through engagement. Um, there was no uh, explicit quid pro quo, uh, but in essence, um, the Chinese understood that there was either going to be uh, progress both on individual cases and systemic advances, um, or there was going to be uh, a black eye for China in the international reputation and media and the press. Um, and, you know, Senator Biden used to tell me, he said, that the hardest thing about being a senator was not deciding, you know, what was important. Uh, the hardest thing about being a senator was what really important thing he wasn't going to do that day. Same thing goes for uh, engagement of the U.S. government in the, in the public space, right? Um, it's, it's easy to take a, a shot at a country like China on human rights. You don't have to do it on any given day, right? You make choices every day uh, in the U.S. government about when, when to raise an issue to a certain level. Um, and making a choice that that's not the day you're going to do it because you believe that your quiet pressure is going to extract movement on your objective, that's a, ch a, ch a choice that uh, U.S. government officials make every day. Any other thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I would say it, depend, it depends on the country again. I mean, obviously, there are countries where there is no hope of movement with, you know, countries like Eritrea or places like Zimbabwe where the U.S. doesn't really have a lot of influence. But uh, in the long run, even this a combination of quiet diplomacy, sustained engagement, um, and public pressure does make a difference. and. In, in the cases of j journalists in prison, it, it guarantees them uh, better treatment in jail because there's a measure of mm -hmm. accountability that the government has. Yes. And um, in places like Africa, it means a whole lot. It's a really big deal if the U.S. ambassador is involved or even attends a court hearing. Uh, it does make a, a big difference. So. The U.S. ambassador to Cambodia um, after a December, sort of the Cambodian version of the December uh, uh, massacre. So this was not a massacre, but the, the, the widespread arrest of human rights activists back, I want to say it was like 2009, but don't quote me. Um, U.S. ambassador went to the house where the, the dissident was being arrested, was there as they were marched out of their house, went to the trial. Those guys got, got released. Um, I mean, Hun Sen back down. Uh, you know, <laughs> I know that there's, um, there's a temptation in Washington, you know, the inside the Beltway mentality is that, you know, the U.S. influence maybe is on the wane. It grows with every mile from Washington, D.C., right? 
Um, and in a place like Cambodia, you know, the words of the U.S. ambassador still matter a lot, a lot, you know. And, and, um, and one of the great frustrations I have at Amnesty International witnessing behavior by my government, which I think does not uphold, you know, the, the best practices, is that I see that influence diminished, you know. Uh, it became harder for me when I was in the Senate to get people out of jail or even to get a, a amelioration of their circumstances when the United States began to hold people without charge indefinitely in Guantanamo Bay. You know, and I would go to my go-to guy in the Chinese Foreign Ministry and I'd say, hey, Lao Peng Yo, you know, uh, let's talk human rights today. And he's like, ah, uh, bu kanang, bu fang bian. It's not convenient. I don't think so. Not right now. Like, why? Well, you know, my government's not very intimidated by your government right now when it comes to human rights. We don't think you're really in a very strong position to criticize us. So to take a hike. Go piss up the rope. Yeah. <laughs> I think that was a very, very interesting comment you just said. We have time for one more comment before we're going to wrap this up. Anybody have a question? A quick one? I a quick follow -up, sort of follow-up question on that issue. Um, and it, it sort of relates to, to whether or not, um, because we're talking about um, U.S. involvement and specifically a number of the countries that have been mentioned are close uh, allies when it comes to counterterrorism measures, do the, do the levers of power and influence change um, because uh, when we're interacting with these countries because we're talking about counterterrorism? So for example, one might meet with the State Department and hear quite strenuously from somebody within you know, the department that handles democracy, rights, and labor that they include it in their reports and that they raise it in their meetings. Um, but does that, is that as effective when there's also a counterterrorism relationship between those two governments? Mm. Um, it, it, is, is, is the message not being conveyed? Because mm. it seems like those people, at least from my perspective, have been absent from those meetings. Yeah. Well, look, it's a very good question. You know, does the U.S. government speak with one voice? Rarely. You know, occasionally it does. Um, uh, sometimes some of the strongest voices for human rights abroad may surprise you. Um, it's not always the State Department, DRL, Bureau folks who are necessarily the most vociferous or the most effective advocates for human rights, uh, as pure as their hearts may be. Um, uh, and on occasion, the U.S. Army Sergeant training the Special Forces Unit in Cambodia may be a more effective advocate for respect for human rights and due process and restraint on the use of force and rules of engagement than would be a civilian. You know, it, it, it's possible, and I, I don't want to impugn, you know, uh, any one part of the U.S. government and say, oh, those guys are incapable of advancing human rights norms, because I've seen good examples of both. You know, I've been with U.S. Special Forces uh, in Zamboanga, who were doing a good job trying to inculcate human rights norms in the Armed Forces Philippines units that they were training. And I've, and I've been with State Department officers in other environments in southern Thailand uh, trying to counteract bad U.S. military propaganda that had led the Thai Special Forces to believe that they could act with impunity. You know, so, um, you know, for sure the U.S. government ought to, across the board, speak with one voice when it comes to human rights norms. We don't always, uh, but we have some effective, we, the U.S. government, I don't work there anymore, uh, the U.S. government has some effective champions. Uh, uh, I wish there were more of them. Yeah. You know, no comment. Well, I think then that, that wraps it up. I think this has been um, a really fruitful and illuminating discussion for me personally. I guess I would just sum it up with this one thought that as the U.S. government pursues its national security interests all over the world, um, there's one thing that I think the last hundred years of people's movements we've seen in South America, the former Soviet Union, and now 
in the Arab world is that, you know, the, the public's desire for human rights, a voice in their government is irre irrepressible. And when we are on the side of the line, on the side that favors um, short-term goals, there we run the risk of being, um, you know, on the wrong side of, of pro-democracy movements that we have seen ultimately tend to come about. That's what we've seen in the course of the last century. So thank you, everybody, for coming here. Again, we've got a great week of sunshine events planned here at the Press Club. I just want to, again, you know, push our Friday lunch um, with a whistleblower. Um, it's going to be a great, great event. You can get your tickets online. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. I don't think it was the intention of the United States uh, uh, in the passing of their post-9-11 laws to give such uh, latitude to governments that were not constrained by a First Amendment, uh, but it has been one of the unfortunate uh, side effects. Now, I love a, a book I can recommend to all of you, uh, Anthony Lewis's uh, biography of the First Amendment, uh, Freedom for the Thought We Hate. Um, uh, the book chronicles the evolution of the protections that are enjoyed uh, or were enjoyed uh, until very recently by U.S. journalists um, that are somewhat unique around the world protections that, that are found in the First Amendment, but which were in fact uh, grown over the course of time through court cases uh, to enable those rights to, to flourish and find full voice. Um, and I think one of the central points of Anthony Lewis's work is that because those rights that so many Americans take for granted are the product of an evolution uh, of judicial activism and judicial interpretation of the Constitution, they're reversible. Uh, we shouldn't think that the First Amendment, as it's understood in 2013, is the First Amendment that we were handed uh, 200 years ago uh, when, the, when the Bill of Rights were enacted into law. Uh, and in fact, I think we're witnessing an assault on, on many of those First Amendment rights uh, right now. Now, as, as Rachel pointed out, uh, the Committee uh, to Protect Journalists has noted that the United States itself uh, in the last 10 years has arrested at least 14 journalists uh, in Afghanistan, Iraq, um, and, and put some of them in Guantanamo Bay uh, in, in indefinitely without charge. Um, and, and this uh, prosecution of those loosely affiliated in some way, often in a very tangential way, with terrorist organizations or terrorist movements around the world, um, the use of national security laws to imprison these journalists uh, sets a really chilling example to the rest of the world when, in fact, the United States should be setting the opposite example, the example of maximum protection for freedom of speech, maximum space for those who want to report uh, about the world around them, maximum protection for their, their freedom of speech. Uh, there's one particular case that Amnesty has campaigned on, the case of uh, Sami al-Hajj at, at Guantanamo. He was a cameraman for Al Jazeera. Uh, spent five years, I think, uh, uh, several years in prison without charge, eventually released, but only after enormous international pressure brought to bear, uh, not just by Amnesty, but by like-minded uh, civil society organizations around the world. Um, imagine yourself as that journalist, attempting to report on the national security challenges around you, the terrorism around you, uh, and being arrested and wrapped up as a co-conspirator uh, because you're trying to do your job as a journalist. Um, and don't think that it couldn't happen to you, I think is the message uh, of this arrest. Um, now, is the United States uniquely responsible for this crackdown on press freedom? I, I think it would be absurd to suggest that. Um, at the same time, the responsibility that rests on the U.S. shoulders uh, as a global example uh, as the only nation that does have a First Amendment, uh, to me, is somewhat profound. All states may have an equal responsibility to ensure freedom of expression, uh, but the United States has a unique capacity uh, to, by its example, help to propagate those values and to help protect them in countries that are not inclined just by their laws or by their culture or by their political history to protect them. So it's a very real, real and serious problem uh, that we face, this tension uh, between uh, promoting freedom of expression 
and finding the appropriate bounds for security um, uh, to make the world a safer place. But it shouldn't be, in fact, uh, an either-or question of liberty and security. I mean, the best way for the United States and other countries to ensure their liberty, uh, to, to ensure their security is, in fact, through the promotion of human rights and, and maximizing human liberty. And violations of human rights are not going to contribute to our security. Um, let me touch on, uh, briefly, on a, a couple of examples around the world. And then I know Mohammed is going to also take us uh, on a kaleidoscopic uh, uh, but, but brief journey around the world to point out some of the concrete examples uh, of what we're talking about in terms of the, the ways in which new laws around the world are constraining press freedom. Um, so look at a country uh, like Ecuador. Uh, the Committee to Protect Journalists has investigated the shutting down of 11 different radio stations in Ecuador, and they've found that many of those uh, were ones that, not surprisingly, were criticizing the government, and they were shut down as a response to their criticism. And Ecuador is also working within the OAS system to undermine that organization, that regional organization's commitment to press freedoms, to water down the commitments. Um, look at country Kuwait, uh, a U.S ally, U.S. treaty ally. The Press and Publications Law, which was revised in 2006, prohibits... On behalf of the National Press Club's Freedom of the Press Committee, I would like to thank you all for coming out during Sunshine Week for what I hope will be an illuminating and thoughtful discussion on what many press freedom advocates believe is an increasingly serious threat to the ability of journalists everywhere to report frankly on government policy without fear of coming under harassment or imprisonment. My name is Rachel Oswald, and I will be our mo your moderator tonight. First, I want to give a plug uh, for Sunshine Week at the Press Club. On Friday, we have a luncheon scheduled for 1230, where our speaker will be Thomas Drake. He's a whistleblower for the NSA who was prosecuted under the Espionage Act. Tickets are $17 and, and can be purchased at press.org. According to a report issued last year by Human Rights Watch, in the years since the terrorist attacks of 9-11, over 140 foreign governments have passed anti-terror laws that have increasingly been used to threaten the ability of journalists everywhere. <clears throat> Human Rights Watch states that, quote, these post-September 11 laws, when viewed as a whole, represent a broad and dangerous expansion of government powers to investigate arrests detain and prosecute individuals at the expense of due process, judicial oversight, and public transparency." End quote. In 2012, a record number of 231 journalists were in prison, according to an investigation by the Committee to Protect Journalists. Of that number, at least 132 journalists were jailed on anti-state charges such as treason, terrorism, and subversion. Currently, U.S. NATO ally Turkey leads all nations in imprisoning journalists with including it leads in China and Iran in the incarceration of journalists with approximately 40 reporters behind bars. Other standouts in this category include Ethiopia, Eritrea, Yemen, and Vietnam. But it is the United States who largely led the way and set the example for using anti-terror laws and national security concerns to stifle the voice of journalism. The Committee to Protect Journalists reports that in the last decade, the U.S. has jailed a minimum of 14 journalists in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Guantanamo Bay. Most were officially never charged, but were broadly alleged by U.S. officials to have committed terror-related crimes or security violations. These allegations have not been backed up by the U.S. government, CPJ has concluded. There has also been a disturbing push domestically to crack down on coverage of U.S. counterterrorism policies. President Obama has personally intervened to keep a well-known Yemeni journalist behind bars. Abdulela Haider Shaya in 2009 reported with evidence that a U.S. airstrike killed 14 women and 21 children in Yemen. Shaya was arrested in 2010 on terrorism charges, but after coming under... ...more expert than I am on the matter to, to address it uh, more fully and to share some of their thoughts. Um, but this topic is one that is very near and dear to me. Uh, I began my professional life as a journalist, uh, writing for the Daily Texan in Austin, Texas. Uh, and at the time, it was my first paying job. Um, and it was so exciting for me to, to make three ninety-five an hour uh, and to write about um, issues like the University of Texas land grabs uh, in East Austin uh, to try to expand their campus. And I even...
experienced uh, in a very small way, not the arrest or intimidation uh, that Mark uh, has experienced, or the uh, indefinite detention, arrest and torture and trial uh, of journalists around the world as part of a crackdown on counterterrorism. But I did witness the power of the state to stifle, uh, intimidate, and otherwise attempt to silence critics. Um, and so it is a subject that uh, I feel a strong personal attachment to. And now that I've joined Amnesty International uh, after 23 years of uh, uh, working on the forces of evil on Capitol Hill and the State Department, um, I, I feel liberated uh, to share with you some of my concerns tonight. Um, so this subject of freedom of the press in a time of heightened national security, international security, and, and, and this uh, uh, paroxysm of, of uh, uh, movements around the world by states um, to put limits on journalists in the interest of security, it's not a new tension. It's not a new phenomenon. In times of warfare and conflict, uh, the first uh, victim, other than truth, uh, is the, the ability of people to speak the truth uh, and to publish the truth, especially if it's an unwelcome truth or critical thoughts. Um, and I was on Capitol Hill on 9-11, on um, and I sat literally on a gutter with Senator Biden for about two hours after the attack. Uh, our cell phones wouldn't work, and we were sitting there uh, wondering how the world was about to change. And the thing that I didn't imagine at the time was the extent to which my own government, through the laws it would enact following 9-11, would contribute to a climate of fear and repression around the world that would empower governments in China or Ethiopia or Bahrain or Saudi Arabia or Israel or Yemen or Venezuela or China. Um, to enact laws in the interest of national security, which would enable them to do the kinds of things that they would love to have been able to do anyway, for other reasons, to just to stifle critics. The civil pressure by then President Saleh, um, but after under, under civil pressure, <coughs> President Saleh was about to issue a pardon when, in February 2011, President Obama spoke with him directly on the phone and requested that Shia remain in prison due to his reported quote association with Al Qaeda. Shai is understood to remain behind bars where he has served more than two years of a five-year sentence. Commenting on the issue in an editorial, The Nation magazine said, quote, while paying lip service to media freedom, this administration has undermined the rights of journalists and the whistleblowers who aid them, whose work has sometimes cast the government in, an, in a negative light, end quote. Our distinguished panel tonight will discuss how anti-terror laws are being used by some governments to suppress reporting they do not like. We will first hear from Frank Januzzi, who serves as executive director of Amnesty Inter of Dep as deputy executive director of Amnesty International USA, and as the head of their DC office, he previously served on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee under our current secretary, under our now Secretary of State John Kerry, where he was a policy director for East Asia and Pacific Affairs. After Frank, we will hear from Mohammed Keita, who is the Committee to Protect Journalists Africa Advocacy Coordinator. Before joining CPJ, Keita volunteered as a researcher for the non-governmental World Federalist Movement Institute of Global Policy, which works to build international democratic institutions. Keita has also done human rights outreach work in West Africa on behalf of the United Nations. Finally, we will hear from Mark Feldstein, a professor of broadcast journalism at the, Uni at the University of Maryland's Philip Merrill College of Journalism. In his two decades spent as an investigative correspondent for ABC, CNN, and other outlets, Feldstein has been roughed up in the United States, detained and censored by authorities in Egypt, and escorted out of Haiti by armed guards. Feldstein's two 2010 book is Poisoning the Press, Richard Nixon, Jack Anderson, and the Rise of Washington's Scandal Culture. I should note that the Press Club did invite the State Department to send a representative to share the Obama administration's views on our panel topic tonight, but they ultimately were unable to provide us with a speaker. Our format tonight will begin with remarks from each of our three panelists. I will ask that each panelist keep the remarks to no more than 15 minutes. I will then follow up with a few opening questions to the panel, and after that, we will turn it over to you, the audience, for what I anticipate will be an engaging, thought-provoking, and challenging debate. Thank you, Rachel. And um, it falls to me, really, just to give you the scene setter this evening. <laughs> 
And because Rachel has done an admirable job of already covering some of the landscape, I will try to be very brief and allow time for the other panelists who are more